Good afternoon and welcome to this IPM webinar with me, Scott Raffle, brought to you today from AHDB. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on IPM of aphid control and capsids in strawberry. So some technical uh, uh, issues to deal with, first of all. Um, all of our attendees are muted. Uh, you can see us, but we can't see you. You can hear us, but we can't hear you. Um, but don't worry, if you wish to um, submit a question at any point during the presentations or again at the end, there is an opportunity there. Um, there's a little mock-up of the control panel on the right-hand side of the screen. And you can see there's a question bar halfway down. If you click on questions, you can submit your question at that, at that stage. Um, we will deal with the questions at the end of each presentation. I should also say that there are basis and neuroso points available for today's webinar. And I'll say a bit more about that at the end. You can submit your registration number to us and uh, we will submit them to basis on your behalf. Now, for any of your colleagues uh, that have not been able to join us this afternoon for this, rec th this webinar, there will be a recording made of this and you can either uh, tell them about it or you can watch it back a second time if you wish to. It'll be available on the AHDB website. So what's this afternoon all about? Well, we are going to be looking at IPM of aphids and uh, capsids and strawberry. Well, why these pests? They've been a big problem for many years for the industry, but they've become an even bigger problem this year. Uh, unfortunately, because we've lost products like Calypso and Pyrethrins, uh, and that's been a big blow to us. And I'll be saying a little bit more about that later on. So we wanted to share with you the results of uh, research information that we funded in recent years on aphids and capsids and give you a better understanding of what we've already found out, what we're continuing to work on, and then I shall say also a few more words about some of the agrochemical issues as well. So um, the programme will look like this. Um, I'm actually going to kick off and deal with the aphid aspect of the, the talk and the presentation, and then uh, I'll invite uh, Dr Michelle Fountain, who's Head of Pest and Pathogen Ecology at NIRBMR, to take us through the capsid work that we've been doing. So I, I shall kick off. And as I mentioned um, just now, the, the big issue with aphids on strawberry has been the loss of a whole load of products. Um, I, I'm rather long in the tooth now. I've been around the industry for a long time and I can remember the days when we had organophosphates. There were any number of different active organophosphates, things like uh, Demeton s methyl dimethoate, heptenophos, chlorpyrifos, all, all uh, any number of organophosphates. And these were all broad spectrum insecticides. So they did a very good job on all the different aphid species that we suffered from back then. But of course, as you know, we've lost all of those and they won't be coming back. Um, we also had the carbamates many years ago. Some of you will remember um, a product, Perimicarb, uh, sold as AFOX, which was more specific than the organophosphates. It uh, was specific to uh, aphid control um, and it worked well, but that too uh, has gone. Um, we still have some synthetic pyrethroids. We have Dasis on outdoor strawberry, but we've got Hallmark on um, outdoor and protected strawberry. That's uh, Lambda Cyhalothrin. But as most of you are aware, it's another broad spectrum insecticide and it's very harmful to IPM uh, beneficial insects and introduced predators. So we try and avoid using that. And more recently, as I mentioned, Calypso, which was thiocloprid, uh, has been lost. And that was a very helpful active to control aphids and other strawberry pests. And also pyrethrins have gone. Uh, and uh, th this has really been the crux of the problem that we've lost these last two products in recent months. So that's the, that's the background to the problem that we face. And uh, I want to now run through some of the results of a research project that we have funded over a period of five years, just to, to, to remind people of what we've learned about aphid control and strawberry, some of the novel uh, approaches to aphid control. Now, SF156 was a five-year project and it was focusing on strawberry pests. I'm only going to talk to you about the results we got from the aphid part of the, that work, but just to, to try and uh, put everything into context and give you a better understanding of what we learned from that project. So we kicked off. I should, should say that Naya BMR, uh, Michelle, who you'll be hearing from later, uh, and her team at East Malling did a lot of this work uh, on pests uh, in combination with ADAS and some others. But uh, the, the majority of work on aphids, I think, was done in Kent uh, using the help of some commercial growers. And the initial work that we did was looking at spray application work on potato aphid. Um, a number of Kent growers had said to us they were having terrible problems getting on top of uh, potato aphid. 
despite the fact they were using all the products that we had available at that time. So we decided to do some research on this, but we did it with a hand lance, and that's crucial because obviously a hand lance uh, imp improves the penetration uh, and coverage of the, of the plant. Um, we kicked off with Hallmark and uh, we looked at Hallmark. This was again targeted at potato aphid on, on a commercial strawberry farm. We looked at Hallmark both with and without a wetter and we got 100% control of the aphids that we, we, we were targeting and, and that had a, a, a long lasting effect. We also at that time used Calypso, a thiocloprid. That gave us some good initial control, um, maybe not quite as good as the hallmark, and it also didn't last as long. Within a few days, the aphid populations were building up again. And we also tried Chess, which was uh, pymetrazine, uh, a product that had approval on uh, protected strawberry. And we looked at that with and without a wetter, and unfortunately the results of that were poor compared to the Calypso and the hallmark. Um, but good coverage is, is always required, and we achieved that with the hand lance, and that's a crucial point, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Of all of those products, only Hallmark still remains, as I mentioned just now. So we then did some more screening work, looking at some modern and uh, new novel uh, active ingredients, and we screened at several products. Of those that we looked at, um, Batavia, which is spirotetramat, and a coded product, gave us very effective control, which lasted for up to three weeks. So that was very encouraging. Um, most of you will be aware that Batavia um, has, has a, an activity within the plant. It's, it's, uh, it moves within the vascular system. The plant needs to be actively growing to work well. And because, of it, because it moves through the plant, um, it, it, it does take rather longer than some active ingredients to control, but it, it worked well. And, and finally, there was another code, coded product which did show good promise against uh, both the species that we found in the, in the field, potato aphid and melon and cotton aphid. We then moved on to natural control and predators. And we did a study on aphid parasitoids, naturally occurring aphid parasitoids, aphidia cervi and prion velucra, which uh, do occur naturally in plantations. Um, aphidias requires uh, more than eight degrees C uh, over a 24 hour period to work well, and prion velucra 12 degrees C. Um, which is fine because uh, we do often get those sorts of temperatures, particularly under tunnels and polythene. Um, the point being that uh, it can work in early spring, but it does slow down at lower temperatures. And of course, in 2020, when we had that this time last year, we had that very good warm spell of weather. It, these, these predators were probably working quite well or these parasitoids worked well. This year, perhaps slightly more difficult because we're having cold nights. So they may not work all day, but they do uh, work for at least part of the day. So just being worth, it's worth being aware of these and uh, looking out for them. So we then followed that up with a survey of aphids and natural predators on another commercial strawberry farm in Kent. Uh, and we, again, we looked at um, the uh, aphids that were predominating on that farm, which were potato aphid and the melon and cotton aphid. And the predators that we found naturally occurring, again, included aphidias uh, and prion velucra. Uh, but we also found lace wings and hoverflies in abundance. So we had a number of naturally occurring predatory insects and we did not apply any insecticides or any products at all, spray products to, to this uh, plantation that we worked on, but we just monitored the numbers of those two aphids and these four predators to, to work out uh, at, uh, you know, what, what the balance was between the two throughout the season. We found that these two aphid species peaked in early June, whereas the predators peaked in early July. So in fact, they did catch up and they did gain control of the potato aphid and the melon cotton aphid. But unfortunately, um, obviously you then have a, a time lag there and there's a period in earlier in the spring where we inevitably, we're going to need extra control measures to gain control at this time of year in this sort of April, May, June spell. Um, another piece of work that we did was uh, looking at garlic. Now, garlic is, uh, treatment is something that a number of commercial growers have alerted us to. Some growers swear by it. They've uh, used it, particularly in glass houses. And uh, effectively, um, what they do is they, they plant the, the garlic set in the strawberry bag. They um, cut the leaves off and they drop the leaves on top of the strawberry uh, plants. Um, 
The, the cut surface releases uh, a chemical volatile, which acts as a repellent, or that's the plan that it acts as a repellent to aphids. So we did this for one year, and we found that doing this activity or following this activity did reduce numbers of aphids. We did the work at the wet centre at uh, East Malling, which is obviously commercially representative of a, a commercial production site. But we found, although it uh, controlled aphid numbers, it wasn't so successful on thrips, which was disappointing. But from an aphid point of view, it seemed to work reasonably well. It didn't have any adverse effects on predatory mites. Um, but based on the fact that this was just a one-year project, we didn't have enough information to be able to promote this growers, promote this uh, technique to growers, although it's something I will come back to uh, later on. So um, those were the, the principal findings from this project. Where does that leave us now? What, what's the guidance resulting from this project and, and other work that we've been doing? Well, um, my advice for, from a starting point of view is obviously crop monitoring and all commercial strawberry growers are monitoring their crops. Most of you use agronomists. Uh, some of you have your own staff that do additional monitoring to outside agronomists, but it's crucial to look for both the pest and the, the predators. So in this picture in the middle here, you can see aphids gasipii, that's melon and cotton aphid. If you've got a problem with that, that does it's resistant to a number of insecticides, but it's also a, a virus transmitter and and it is a virus vector for strawberry mottle virus, which you can see in the picture on the right. So obviously, if we've got a pr problem with aphids cipii, we need to do something about it. Potato aphid can also, and a strawberry aphid can also uh, transmit viruses. Glass-sized potato aphid is less of a problem. Um, so if you can identify which species of aphid you've got, then that's important. But equally, it's also important to monitor for the naturally occurring predators. And on this slide, you can see there is a lace wing larva in the bottom left hand corner and also a mummified aphid there which has been attacked by aphidious parasitoid which lays its egg on the aphid the egg hatches into a larva which burrows into the uh, internal uh, contents of the aphid kills the aphid pupates and the adult emerges to, to lay its egg in another aphid so look out for signs of these predators and if you've got a, a lot of them that's good news if you don't then you may need to Im implement other control measures Spraying, of course, is inevitable. We're going to have to use some spraying. Now, some work that we funded some years ago as part of a DEFRA horticulture link project demonstrated that the use of a, a, an aphicide late on in the season in the autumn months significantly reduced the overwintering populations for the spring. Um, you can also use a, a spray in the spring as well. Um, but the important point is that you've got to go into the season with low numbers of aphids, low populations, because if you've got a high population at the start of the season, you're going to have big problems. Uh, and obviously with very few products available to us, then that's going to be even worse. So aim to get control uh, late in, in the autumn uh, or early, and or early spring. So what are your current spray options? Well, of course, we've still got Hallmark, but as I said, it's incompatible with IPM. And a single application uh, within the project that I've just talked about actually had no effect on Neocelis cucumeris. Now, that was interesting because we expected it would do. But having said that, I think we, we certainly want to re avoid repeated applications of pyrethroids because there's no doubt that will be uh, deleterious to your naturally occurring insects and any uh, uh, introduced predators. So really, you want to avoid Hallmark if, if you possibly can. You could possibly use it in the autumn as a cleanup spray with the hope that after eight to 12 weeks into the following spring, uh, that any residue will have disappeared, but um, pref preferably avoid it if you can. We do now have Batavia, as I mentioned earlier, that is now uh, approved for use, two applications during the season, once before flowering and once post harvest. So limited number of applications, but nonetheless, uh, we found from our research that it works well and that's an option for your autumn or spring cleanup. And then, of course, there are also physical acting products um, such as Agri 50E or perhaps more commonly used fat, uh, fatty acids sold as flipper by Bayer. Now, again, a number of growers have complained that they, they feel they don't always get good control with flipper. So it's something I looked into recently. I contacted Jack Hill at Bayer, who was very helpful, and I asked him what work Bayer had done to try and uh, demonstrate the how to get best efficiency out of flipper uh, and there were a number of things that uh, that Jack highlighted one of course is good coverage and um, it's absolutely vital to hit these uh, all aphids with flipper or else you won't kill kill them uh, it's fatty acid it will strip the wax off the aphids so you really need to to hit them to kill them 
So all growers really need to consider whether they're getting good application uh, of the centre of the crown of the plant, the underside of the leaves. Is it working? Now, you can do that using a fluorometer. Uh, there's an image here on the right of a fluorometer being used in a cereal crop. And the bigger picture there depicts uh, Charles Whitfield, who's one of Michelle Fountain's colleagues at NIRBMR. He did some work for us in a raspberry project a couple of years ago where he, he did some fluorometer, fluorometer work to assess the, the spread and the coverage being achieved in a raspberry crop. And effectively, he, he sprayed the crop with a fluorescent tracer dye and then he uses the handheld imaging uh, fluorometer, which actually re records fluorescence values. And that can be used as a proxy for leaf coverage. And that uh, helpfully guided us to what, what, just, just how good our spray penetration was in a raspberry crop. So do try it with strawberries if you can get hold of this technology or use it other. There's various other ways of measuring spray deposit. But you really seriously have to look at your coverage to make sure that you, with, with whatever spray you're using, that it's working well. Other uh, suggestions that, that Bayer gave to us were the use of angled nozzles into the crop. Uh, the Jack Hill suggested the Guardian air type, uh, again, making the point that you, if you don't hit it, you won't kill the aphid. Um, the other point is you really need to use this before populations build up. I, I often like aphid, aphid colonies to penguins in the Antarctic, where you've probably seen on uh, David Attenborough's programmes all these penguins huddled together to keep uh, warm. Um, if you were trying to hit them with a spray, you'd hit the outside ones, but not the middle ones. And I think the same is true of aphid colonies. So um, once they've built up to numbers, you're not going to hit them all. They protect each other. Try and use the product when the aphid numbers are very low. Also spray when aphids are active because uh, they're more likely to pick up any spray deposit and pick up any, any uh, of the flipper that's been applied. And the other thing that Jack Hill suggested was to spray when there's more moisture on the leaf. That appears to work better with flipper um, either early in the morning uh, or later in the day. Obviously, sometimes after cool nights, you'll get uh, condensation and dew on the leaf in the morning and similarly later in the day. So that's worth noting as well. Um, resistance management. I mentioned earlier that APHIS CPI has developed resistance to a number of different products over the years. Do follow the manufacturer's recommendations. We don't want to develop uh, res resistance. I know but it's, it's, it's tempting to use products repeatedly, but uh, there is a reason why Batavia can only be used twice and it's to avoid resistance from building up. So do follow the, the guidelines. Now, as we found out from our re earlier research, the naturally occurring predators can, do build up and can build up in, in, in plantations, and you need to monitor those, and your agronomist will help you with this. But of course, they can't be relied on uh, for uh, early season control, but they will help for, for later on. So do look out for, um, you'll see a, a lacewing larvae on the right-hand side, uh, <clears throat> hoverfly larvae in the middle at the bottom, and then the mummified aphid, and an antichorid bug. All of these will control and, and, and go somewhere to reducing aphid populations for you. But inevitably, there's this period of difficulty early in the spring, this sort of time of year, April, May and early June, when you can do more to try and gain control. Um, if, you, if your flipper uh, has, has been used and if you use your Batavia, you will probably need to in, uh, actively introduce predators and parasitoids. So if it is early, um, it needs to go in, but when temperatures are exceeding 8 degrees C, and that is important. Uh, a number of commercial products are available for the biocontrol companies with mixes of parasitoids and predators in them. Speak to your biocontrol agents and be guided by them. Um, another predator which is regularly used, uh, this is the predatory midge, Ephidolites ephidomyza, the picture is kindly donated by BioBest. Um, this is crucial to know that this works at 15 degrees C and above, so it needs to go in a bit later, usually from about mid-May onwards, when the temperatures are reliably above 15 degrees. Um, one thing I should point out about this predatory image is it does pupate in the soil. So if you're on a glasshouse situation with a concrete floor, that's not too helpful. Or it's equally, if you've got a white polythene mulch, that's not going to work either for you. So it may be that you're having to put uh, repeated introductions uh, in those situations. In crops with soil beneath them, um, this is more likely to pupate the soil and come back and uh, uh, build up in numbers of populations to start uh, building up. So the pests will feed and breed and, and pupate. Um, if you are considering garlic, um, although we're not actively recommending it, if you want to trial it on a trial basis, uh, we would suggest using a hard neck variety such as violet. Um, plant it in the autumn so it's established uh, for control in the spring. Um, space one metre apart for maximum effect. 
And then once it's established, snap the leaves at least fortnightly, but I think a lot of growers use it weekly. Snap the leaves off, lay them on the surface, and the volatiles emitted will help to repel any aphids. So what else is AHDB doing? Because there is a lot of um, fretting going on at the moment, a lot of people struggling to control aphids. Well, we are trying to do other things to secure new products. I mentioned earlier on some coded products um, we, we trialed earlier on in the SF156 project. We are trying to work to secure some of these for the industry. There are some political issues over uh, registration. Uh, and there are also some, some of these products, if we do get them, they are likely to be uh, restricted to use in permanent protection full enclosure situations. Um, there's not a lot we can do about that. It all depends on uh, the data, the safety data that's available and whether we've got the support of the manufacturers and whether they're wanting to or willing to uh, go for an EMU uh, in um, protected crops or outdoor situations. Um, we have applied, my colleague, a crop protection colleague Adam Doxford has applied last year for Mainman, which is flunicamid on uh, as an emu for outdoor and protected strawberry. We know that flanicamid works well on aphids and apple, so we would hope that it'll work well in strawberries. We uh, That was submitted some months ago. We're still waiting for uh, for results on that. But, uh, we, we, we continue to hope to get that, to secure that for the industry. Um, Gazelle, which is acetamiprid, another product that works well on apples for aphid control. We've applied for that on protected strawberry. And also on protected strawberry, we've applied for an EMU for pyrethrum uh, to re re return pyrethrum's use to protected strawberry. None of these are available yet, and we, uh, CRD, continue to work on them, uh, and we continue to hope and pray that we can maybe secure some of these for later this year. So I think that really brings me to a conclusion and uh, brings me to the end of what I wanted to, to say. Um, there is an opportunity now for some questions. Um, I'd also like to bring Michelle in, if Michelle can join us, if you uh, switch your camera on, Michelle, and people can see you. Um, Michelle uh, has led all the work, the research that we have been doing uh, for the industry, and she um, it was in, an integral part to all of this, uh, and she's also doing some further work at the moment. So, uh, Michelle, have we got you? Yes, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear We've me? We've got okay? you. That's fine. We've got you. Good. Lovely. Michelle, just okay. tell us a little bit more about Project SF174, which HDB is funding now, which you're leading, uh, is doing some more work on aphids. Can you perhaps tell our audience what, what's going on there as well at this stage? Yeah, Scott, we've got um, three main lines of inquiry for aphid control in that project. Um, the first one is actually happening now. So um, my colleague Adam Walker is out in strawberry crops in Kent and he's working with a new copper product, which is um, hoverflies. Um, and the hoverflies come sort of ready to go in the crop. The idea being that um, when they're released, they feed on the nectar on the flowers. So they're also potentially doing a bit of pollination. And then they will go and um, seek out aphid colonies, the early ones in the spring, and lay their eggs for um, predation. So that's the first part. That's actually sort of in the middle of um, testing at the moment. Um, the second bit of work that we've been doing is in floral margins, which are obviously going to become more and more important as, as, we, as you mentioned, we haven't got the products. Um, and also potentially as part of the new ELM schemes. And um, my other colleague, Selena Silva, has been assessing those at the wet centre over the last two years. And actually, the, the native wild flower mixes seem to be a really good resource of natural enemies on the perimeters of the crops, um, and including plenty of aureus in those wild flower margins. So this year, she'll be looking at how far those predators move into polytunnel crops. And then finally, the um, parasitoid work that you mentioned, that was done by um, primarily by Tom Pope at Harper Adams as part of the project. And we'll be working with him and Ali Carley from James Hutton again this year. And what we'd like to do with the changing pesticide programmes is to get a handle on which species of those parasitoids are now surviving over the winter inside the aphids and look at um, what proportions of aphids that overwinter are actually already parasitized, so potentially sitting there as, as a banker for new parasitoids that emerge in the spring. Good, so quite a lot of activity going on, Michelle. Thank you for updating us on that. That's really helpful. Um, 
we have one or two questions or comments that have come in here. Uh, there's one I'm afraid I don't quite understand. Somebody's asked, is main man no longer being discontinued? That's uh, John Majorism there, double negative. I'm not quite sure what that question means. Um, what I, I do know is that we have applied for main man and CRD are, are currently working on it. Um, it's to, to my knowledge, it's still approved. It's certainly still a, a registered for use on apples and pears, and that's why we're trying to get it a, 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 as an EMU. So hopefully that will help. Um, and another helpful comment here, somebody's uh, telling me that the, the fluorometer, which I mentioned in respect to spray coverage, is to be commercially launch shortly. So apologies, uh, I didn't realise that it wasn't yet available, uh, but it sounds as if it's going to be coming out um, quite soon. But there are other ways and means of uh, monitoring and assessing spray coverage, so please do to, to follow those if you can. Okay, I think if there are no other questions, which I don't believe there are, thank you, Michelle, for your update. Um, and Michelle, I'm going to introduce you now to take us through the CAPSID work that you and your team have been working on. And um, I think we're just about ready. We've got the technology right. So, Michelle, tell us all that, uh, that's been going on on push-pull strategies for controlling capsids. OK, so hopefully you can see my screen and I'm just putting it into um, slideshow. Good. OK, so this is um, it's a bit of a journey, actually, of how we got to the control of capsids using um, semiochemicals. Um, and I just wanted to mention right at the beginning of this uh, work that we wouldn't have been able to do this without the excellent collaboration we've had with David Hall and his team at the Natural Resources Institute at Greenwich. So obviously, um, David Hall and Jerry Cross were working together a long time before I joined in 2006. And that collaboration has continued. And that's that's kind of what I'm going to talk you through um, this afternoon. So capsid species generally under the genus of Ligus are major pests worldwide. So it's not just us that has a problem with them. Um, there are species that are detrimental to uh, cotton and also to alfalfa, uh, particularly in the US. And researchers in the US and Europe had been working on these species for over 30 years, um, still without an effective synthetic pheromone for attraction, um, let alone even control. And at that point, they basically said, let's just give up. There's no point in continuing with this um, uh, pursuit. So unwilling to uh, give up at East Morling, Jerry Cross won a project, a Hort Link project, to look at the pheromones of um, capsid species in UK crops. So the two that we focus on are Ligus rugula penis, which is the one at the top, and that's mostly a pest on strawberry, but also raspberry and cucumber, and the common green capsid Ligochoris pabulinus at the bottom, which is a pest of uh, tree fruit, raspberry and strawberry, and in recent years has also become a bit of a problem on cherry as well. So the work that had been done up to that point had shown that male capsids were attracted to females. And Paul Inocenzi, who was at East Morling before me, um, actually found the three synthetic compounds, which are here at the bottom. Uh, so the three compounds that were released by females only, and then uh, demonstrated that males gave a positive antennal response to these three compounds but he couldn't get them to work in the field for some reason. And the top um, compound there, which is hexylbutyrate, I'll be talking a lot about that today. And that was really the reason why he couldn't get it to work in the field. So when we started the new project, we went back to the drawing board. And the first thing I did was um, cage unmated female capsids in these old fashioned 1950s hair rollers. Um, and then we looked at what time the male capsids were attracted to those females. And we actually found that most of the attraction was happening from um, sort of dawn to noon time. And actually most of the time during the day, there was no attraction of males to females. And what we also discovered when we reran the um, analysis of what the females were emitting in terms of volatile chemicals, was there was much lower levels of hexylbutyrate in the morning compared to the um, afternoon and evenings. So 
that was good. So it looked like we needed lower amounts of hexarbutyrate in our sex pheromone attractant. However, to do, because we've now looking at three compounds, or having lots of different ratios would have been very time consuming um, if we were to do that in replicated trapping trials. So we employed um, a different piece of kit, and this is a, a piezoelectric sprayer. So it has this uh, vibrating plate here attached to a drawn um, glass needle, which volatilizes the liquid at the end of the needle. And that really is to mimic a, um, a female pheromone gland. And of course, because we knew that the females were attracting the males first thing in the morning, we set this up in the dark at about four o'clock in the morning, because obviously they're all active in the summer. And so that once the sun came up, we were ready to um, test different blends of those three compounds. And here I'm going, just showing you the video of the sort of eureka moment when we actually tested one blend and we started to get um, male insects then attracted into this plume. And you can see the insects flying around the plume there. I did make sure that I uh, text, texted, it was the old days, my colleagues at five o'clock in the morning to tell them that we'd had that breakthrough. So we've now got um, a pheromone attractant. So we thought, OK, so now can we start not only just to use this for monitoring, but can we start to use it to control in the insects in the crop? So we then um, secured some uh, EU, EU funding, Core Organic 2, and we started to look at mass trapping in crops. So we had 50 traps per hectare of these green cross vein bucket traps, which we'd already shown to be effective. And we had a trial where we compared areas where we were mass trapping compared to not trapping. And bearing in mind, we're only trapping the males here, not the females. And then we scored the fruit in the center of these plots as no damage, slight, moderate or severe damage. And this is a summary table of the results from that trial. And this was in an organic strawberry crop. And we can see here that the assessment of the undamaged fruits, we were getting um, sort of 14, well, more than 10% in general, um, extra undamaged fruit where we had the mass traps compared to the untreated. So we were increasing um, the yield of undamaged fruit. So that, that was good and uh, promising. And then nothing happened for a little while. And then we decided to start um, investigating the hexarbutyrate more as a repellent. And once we'd done some small trials to demonstrate that that was repellent to capsid bugs, we then started to think about devising a push-pull system. So this is where you have the repellent in the center of the crop. So this would be our hexarbutyrate. And then we have the attractants and the traps around the outside of the crop. So we're pushing away and pulling the insects into traps. And the good thing about this um, technique is it's generally using non-toxic compounds, and it's also compatible with other um, control methods in the crop as well. So here I'm just showing the, the setup of what the pull was. So these are the traps. So not only did we have the female sex pheromone, which is released from this uh, pipette tip. Um, so this is obviously just attracting males, but also by that time, we'd been looking at semiochemicals which attract females. And there's a plant volatile, which is released um, normally by the uh, flowers of, of many different plants called phenylacetaldehyde. And so we also incorporated this and that attracted both male and female capsids into the trap. So in 2017, we set up um, some experiments on a conventional on conventional sites, and this is one replicate of that experiment. And the plots were 25 by 25 meters, and we had untreated areas, and then we had areas treated with the hexyl butyrate at distances of two meters apart. So that was the push only. Then we had the pull only, so just the traps around the perimeter. And then we had the push, the hexarbutyrate, and in combination with the pull. So here's an example of one of the traps around the outside. And then we assessed the numbers of capsids in the crop. 
and the amount of fruit damage that occurred in the centres of these plots. And the first thing um, that we observed was that where we had the hexile butyrate, we had um, half the number of capsid nymphs compared to um, without hexile butyrate. And we had a similar story with adults. So it looks like it was repelling adults and nymphs. And then when we look at the fruit damage, so this is the mean percentage of fruit damage, um, of damaged fruit with no capsid damage. And you can see that in the control, we've got uh, fewer fruits that are um, have capsid damage than in the push pool. So wherever we've got a push, we're sort of starting to increase the amount of um, marketable fruit. So about 15% more marketable fruit. And then in 2019, we actually moved into organic strawberry because um, we were having um, issues with finding enough damage in conventional crops. So we repeated the trial again. This time we looked at whether we could, so this was our push-pull treatment from 2017. So we doubled the number of hexyl butyrate sachets and we also increased the amount of hexyl butyrate within a sachet to see if we were getting any extra control by doing that. And the first uh, results from, from these trials showed, so this is the mean numbers of capsids per 50 plants. So really quite high for the numbers of nymphs. We've almost got one nymph per plant. Um, and you can see that wherever we've got hexyl butyrate, no matter how we're releasing it, we're getting significantly fewer nymphs and significantly fewer adult capsids. So what does this equate to in terms of um, marketable fruits? Well, this is the numbers of marketable um, fruits we're getting from the control plots where we don't have the hexyl butyrate. And this is the amount um, of hex of marketable fruit. So we're getting 50% more marketable fruit in those organic crops. So it really is a good solution for organic crops. And then in 2020, we thought, well, if it works on strawberry, will it also work on other crops? So we did a trial in um, raspberry and we just had three treatments. So we had the, um, the control without, but of course now we're dealing with a much more vertical crop. So we initially, we put the hexyl butyrate at two meter spacings just along the middle. And then we also staggered it to see if that changed the plume and, and therefore changed the numbers of capsids we had in those crops. And again, it was a replicated experiment. So in this uh, chart, the bars on the left hand side before the blue dotted line are actually the numbers of capsids that we were observing in the crop. So this was just before they were starting to come into the crop. And you can see that after we deploy the repellents, we, the numbers of um, capsid nymphs continued to increase in the control but there were fewer where we had the um, hexyl butyrate and there was no difference between the way that we deployed the hexyl butyrate, whether that was in a straight line along the middle or staggered. Ooh. And then in terms of raspberry, what that meant was an 8% increase in the amount of marketable fruit, so fruits without, without any capsid damage. So that again, that was really promising. So in conclusion, we've now got a synthetic push-pull system for controlling um, pest capsids in commercial strawberry. Um, it significantly reduces both um, tarnished plant bug and common green um, capsid. Um, and we didn't get any extra benefit by putting in more um, hexyl butyrate release sachets. So the question is, can we get the same benefit by now stretching out those um, release point so every five meters or every 10 meters for example and these synthetic semi-chemicals the prototypes that we tested were effective for at least a month and we also um, had success in raspberry so all this work is is now published so um, you can if you want to read more detail on a bit more of the biology of the insects and how this works um, they're available in 
in published articles. But this year, as part of um, SF174, what we're going to try to do is look at how much we can get away with spacing the dispensers apart. This will obviously make it more affordable in terms of dispensers, but also labour in deploying them. Um, what we are looking for are some volunteer sites in the southeast. Um, so we've got a couple already, um, but we'd like to uh, acquire some more sites to in increase our replicates. So if there are any growers listening who are happy to host us on their farm, that would be great. And if you could email either myself or Adam Walker at NIAB, um, we'll be in, back in touch with you. And thank you. That's my uh, last slide. Uh, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. Uh, that's it's it's quite exciting to get this sort of information, and I know that you and your colleagues have been very pleased with some of the results we certainly have at, at AHDB. Um, I, I, one thing I didn't mention earlier on, of course, when I was talking about aphid control, was uh, in our terms of our applications for gazelle and for spruce it on strawberries, sorry, pyrethrum on strawberries, one would hope that they might have some impact on uh, capsids as well, should we get them secured. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the, we, we have to look, look, look to the future now, and the future mm -hmm. is biocontrol and integrated pest management, there's no doubt, because we're going to continue to lose more and more products. So this sort of work that you've explained to us today is very exciting. Um, the other thing just I should say is that uh, we at AHDB are collaborating and working with commercial organisations and CRD to uh, try and develop this idea and to see whether there's any realistic way of getting this approved for use by growers. Obviously, it's not at the moment, but we are working on that. So um, watch this space. Yeah, um, so, the, so we are working actually with um, a UK semi-chemical producing company and they are actively pursuing registration at the moment. So I'm, I'm hoping this gets through and I'm hoping, you know, that it, it, a sensible decision is made and we could start using it actively in crops because I think I think for the conventional crops it would actually mitigate the need to use insecticides against capsids it's so effective yeah yeah I think it is um, I'm just having a look at questions please do submit any more questions we've got a little bit of time left over um, for questions um, I'm just going to bring Michelle back to a question which was uh, raised after our aphid talk, which I think is still relevant to this, and it's certainly relevant to aphids. Um, actively managed wildflower strips have been successfully used in sweet cherry under polytunnel systems at the University of Worcester. Could this approach be applied in strawberry crops to boost natural predators rather than having wildflower strips outside the tunnels? Now, I should say, yeah. we, we, Michelle's doing a lot of work on this uh, as uh, at, at the wet centre at East Malling, where you've actually got wildflower strips outside. But anyway, Michelle, tell us a bit more and give us your views on that. Yeah, so, so in the past, um, I guess strawberry growers have been quite reluctant to put wildflowers into tunnels. Um, and the main reason for this has been sort of a fear of introducing or cultivating thrip species actually inside the tunnels. So we currently have one year's worth of data um, from the wet centre, from the, from the margins, and we'll be expanding that um, across some commercial sites where we've got wildflower margins. And um, my colleague, Selena, has been identifying the thrip species that she's been finding in those flowers. The majority of them are non-strawberry thrips. And um, there are very low numbers actually in those flowers. What we haven't done and what we haven't had sort of quite enough funding to date to do is to actually look at the species of larvae. So we now know which species of flower or we've got a starting point for which species of flower have which adult species of thrips in them. So we know which ones to avoid in terms of adults. Um, what we're not quite sure on yet is which species of flower they're actually breeding in. So I feel a little bit like we need to get a bit more of this information before we go ahead and um, start trialling on a large scale inside the tunnels. Um, but I do know there are a couple of growers that are working with us in the bespoke projects that are keen to start putting wildflowers into um, small areas of polytunnel crops for soft fruit. 
Thank you, Michelle. Um, we have another question for you. Does use of semiochemicals prevent soft fruit being classed as organic if no direct contact with the crop? Yeah, it's a good question. You would hope so, wouldn't you? I guess that's a more of a question for CRD. I mean, I know there are some pest control measures in other parts of Europe which are even using insect synthetic insecticides but because they're not in touch with the crop and they're contained within traps they have got um, organic approval so there's no reason that hexylbutyrate wouldn't be used um, wouldn't be classed as organic um, particularly as well as it's a basic substance um, so it should in theory be acceptable for organic but I guess that's a question for CRD yeah, I, th I think um, I think the other thing that we, we've perhaps 2021 has been a a landmark, if you like, because up until now we've always had something else, haven't we, with uh, agrochemicals, pro spray products for things like aphids and capsids. Uh, there's always been at least one product available to us, and we've really hit the buffers this year because, as I said at the start, we've lost calypso and we've lost py uh, pyrethrins products. And we are really being faced now with looking at alternative options. And I think there's no doubt we've just got to keep on with this work, Michelle. We've got to carry on down this path because we've got to try and keep finding extra help for growers, novel techniques to use to, to deliver new solutions to growers. They're not ever going to be quite as perfect as spraying something which kills 100% like you get with Hallmark. And But I think we've got to accept that, haven't we, that we, we'll, we're trying to get on top of things, but we'll never get perhaps 100% control. Is, 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 is that your view? Do you share that um, opinion? Yeah, I guess I would also argue that we probably don't get 100% control even with the insecticide some of the time. So it's about having that balance, isn't it? And it's about um, fostering and protecting what we've actually got that's out there for free. So, for example, with the wildflowers, whether that's margins or within the crop, these are able to, um, you know, provide a resource of natural enemies that, you know, in, in your original talk you were talking about um you know natural enemies coming in from july well can we get them boosted much quicker by having for example floral margins where we can start building up the populations much quicker and getting them into the crop quicker so yeah i mean it's all going to be part of the new government subsidy schemes as well so it's something that we need to really kind of pay serious attention to i think yeah okay uh, well, a slightly related question to that. Um, do you have any evidence of marigold flowers as a repellent for aphids and capsids, noting evidence in combating white fly? Any views on that? Uh, no, I think is a short answer. You mean you have no evidence or you've got no knowledge of it? I've got no knowledge of it. Um, I can't remember whether Jean Fitzgerald before for me worked in that area but yeah I would that's something I would have to kind of look up and get back to you on um, okay. but I mean the the issue with using plants as repellents is that you're then dealing with a second crop essentially um, I think the reason that the garlic works so well is because it took, it didn't really need any maintenance once the bulb the garlic bulb was in there it was just a case of when the pickers went through, they were also just snapping the leaves as they went through and picked the fruit. So it was quite simple. I guess as soon as you introduce a new plant, you're also having to look after the husbandry of that as well. Yeah, yeah. OK, um, I don't think we've got any other questions as such, um, Michelle. So thank you. I think we'll bring it to a conclusion if there are no other questions. Uh, Michelle, thank you very much indeed uh, for your time uh, and for all the work you do on behalf of the industry, because it's some fantastic new, new work that's coming out. We do hope that it won't be too long before the results of some of Michelle's work can actually be adopted commercially uh, in the industry. So thank you very much indeed for joining us today, Michelle. Um, I have had a comment about basis points. Um, so sitting on your screen there is the code um, if you want to apply for basis points and a code for Neuroso points there in red. Um, if you wish to submit them now, you can. If on your right hand side of your screen, if you've got the uh, control panel, if you click on handouts, uh, there will be an opportunity for you there to complete your registration details. So click on handouts. I'll leave this slide up for a bit longer. 
uh, you can do that. If you um, prefer not to use that form, you can send them to me. So if you want to take a note of my email address, in fact, you can see it right in front of you on that slide, scott.raffle at ahdb.org.uk. Uh, if you submit to me your uh, request for basis points for this event, uh, and then I'll pass them to Claire, my colleague, who will make sure that they're included on the form that we submit directly to basis and similarly in a row so. Um, but uh, just giving people a bit of time to read the or take a note of the, the codes there. If you want to put them in, as I say, on that question bar, just click on that and you can enter it there. So uh, that's the situation regarding basis and Eroso points. Just a reminder again that the recording will go uh, out on our AHDB website, hopefully sometime next week, and you will be able to view it again. If you've got any colleagues that haven't had a chance to watch, to view it again next week. And I'm going to just make a plug for some future AHDB webinars now uh, and just move the slide along. Oh. There we go. So we have some more uh, webinars which should be of interest to you. Uh, next week, there is a wet center webinar, precision technology developments at the wet center. Many of you will have viewed previous webinars about the wet center. This latest one will give you an update on our work program for 2021. Uh, that takes place next Thursday on the 6th of May from four o'clock to five. So the same time slot uh, next Thursday, 6th of May. If you uh, want to find out more details, you can go on our web page. Then we have more IPM webinars coming up. Um, these two are for ornamental crops, but I think they are very relevant for soft fruit crops as well. Both of them are entitled Selection and Use of Biological Control Agents in the Production of Ornamental Crops. The first of these concentrates on aphids and white flies. That takes place on Thursday, the 27th of May, all again at the same time slot, four to five in the afternoon. Uh, and then the second of these two is focusing on thrips and mites, and that's Thursday the 17th of June, 4 to 5 p.m., so uh, a, a month later. You can find details about all of our webinars and these three specific ones at our events page. If you go on to ahdb.org.uk forward slash events, or if you just go on to HDB website and click on events, you will see all the future events. If they don't show, you can click on load more, and they will load up some more into the future. So I think people will benefit hugely because there's a lot of crossover there between ornamental and uh, certainly protected soft fruit. So if you're interested in those, please register and join us for those. But uh, in the meantime, thank you to all of you for joining this afternoon. Uh, thanks for, I hope you've benefited uh, from this latest research that we've done. Thank you to Michelle. And finally, just to say, when you log out of this webinar, you will receive a form which you'll be asked to complete. It's very helpful to us if you do, so you can tell us what worked, what didn't work, and we can then hopefully improve the quality of future webinars that we do for you. But uh, in the meantime, have a very good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Thank you all. Bye.